Thanks, Jay. Uh, probably, this is the first time I've done this presentation, so I'll start out with excuses, which in our society today makes me a true American. <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> it's harder to put these things together than it is uh, to actually pull it off. And with the weather like this and me trying to fly a plane in today, it's been a, a harrowing day that will sometime around midnight tonight end up in Fort Drum, New York. So uh, I don't know why an old guy like me, uh, I'm actually not that old, putting this brief together. I'm 32, and I had <laughs> completely dark hair just about a month or two ago. But I do want to say a couple quick things. Jay's a great spokesman for the Commemorative Air Force. It's the only club that I've joined a second time or a third time around where you have to pay to have friends. And uh, I am gladly paying the dues for this Commemorative Air Force because it's a great group of people to be around. I've never seen a better group of people to be around other than perhaps my 23 and a half years in the Navy. And I think, how many of you have served in Army, Navy, Marines or something? Many of you. I will say this though, if you're thinking about joining this group, I will guarantee you, you won't be disappointed. I will also tell you that there's a large chunk of people that did not serve in the military. This is not all military people by any stretch. Jay? Were you in the military? I was not. So our commanding officer wasn't in the military. So he rose all the way to the top. So if you're not in the military and you just like old planes and like this kind of stuff, join and be around a bunch of fine people. Uh, the Elbirds are neat for me. We got some guests here that I'll introduce in just a minute. Uh, that's a picture that one of our members took at Atlanta Warbirds weekend last year of my plane, and it looks a lot better. Uh, it's a lot better picture. Uh, if you see it other than up on the board and I was since they, they used it to promote this I went ahead and put it up there but what we'll do is we'll walk through some slides we have a movie as well that's called a little plane that could it's narrated by Cliff Robertson anybody know who he is he's in the uh, Aviation Hall of Fame if you didn't know that he was actually the EAA Young Eagles Genesis guy before Harrison Ford and some of those guys and of course, Cliff Robertson passed away just a few years ago. This film will show in a little while, it was about five years old. It was done by the International Liaison Pilots Organization. It looks like a History Channel show. Did not make the History Channel because there was so much disagreement with the fact that it was, uh, it emphasized the Brody system, which was something that we did very little with the L birds, but it was so unique to catch a plane with a hook on out there beside an LST. Uh, and the Elbert guy said it was too much of that. And uh, but anyway, and Cliff Robertson, when you do see the film, is actually sitting. When this film was made uh, several years ago, he is sitting in that L5 right there. Not one like it. He's in that one. And I talked to the gentleman who sold that plane back uh, a decade ago, or to donate it to a museum, and uh, he verified. He told me the whole day how they did the shooting that day to make the movie or the little film. But anyway. Uh, anybody in here, an Elbert aficionado, you consider yourself pretty much an expert on this stuff? Okay, Vince, so I'll have to contend. Only with you, it looks like. Either that or nobody's raising their hand. I bought that plane out there a year ago. I've always wanted to own an Elbert, and uh, I don't have $2 million. So the Mustang was a little bit out. Uh, Corsair, some of those. And uh, this is a wonderful plane to fly. And uh, you'll get to go out and see it if you want to later. Maybe touch it. Please don't poke holes in it. Very expensive to repair. Uh, the thing with these uh, liaison airplanes is this is a comment that Willard sent me, I think. Uh, Artillery can do things in fine weather that it cannot do in bad weather. If you're to succeed in landing your shells, sounds like a British comment, you must have observation in the air. In this way, the Air Force is absolutely vital for just one thing as an adjunct to the middle artillery. It sees where the enemy positions are, it photographs them, it reports where your shells are landing, and it tells you to correct the range. You've got to have your flyers up there observing. That's a World War I plane, so this is not new. As you all know, they used balloons back in the Civil War, so observing from above is why you take the high ground. There's probably some Marines and Army guys here will tell you it's better to look down and see what the enemy's doing. Uh, but anyway, that's not one of the World War II Elberts. And sort of, neither is this. 
this is before World War II when we were starting to get into this mode of trying to find the planes. This is called a 058. They, they went back and forth. Oh, it was not zero, it was O. For observation, these are Arancas here and they're there waiting on the war games to start. Um, we did not fly these into war. That symbol with a red dot in the middle of the star, anybody know how that disappeared? If you're fighting the Japanese, you don't want a meatball inside your star, and that's why they removed it. That's not a joke, that's the truth. There's five types of L birds that made it into the program. We got, we may have three here, we sort of do if you count the yellow cub out there. The L1 Stinson, which is made for the same company that makes my plane, or made my plane, if there is no longer a Stinson. The Vigilant is that one on the left. I wish I had a picture of it beside the other planes. It didn't make a lot of them. It had a 300 horsepower radial engine. Uh, we gave a bunch to England. It had a 52 foot wingspan. And it was 12 to 14 feet longer than any of the other Elbers. And it didn't carry that much more. It drank gas. It had a max speed, a cruise speed of 100 miles an hour. And it was one of the largest single seat aircraft built in its day. And uh, we did use them in Burma. Uh, there's a time later, if I forget to tell you, where Hap Arnold actually told the uh, Merrill's Marauders and those folks that were fighting in Burma, they couldn't figure out how they were going to supply them because when he said, I'll, I'll bring you all the C-47s that you can stomach, and uh, the, they told him, you won't have a place to land them. So Hap Arnold went back to the drawing board and said, we'll do it with L-1s and L-5s. So they were going to supply these guys with planes with about a 500 pound capacity because this plane was big but it only exceeded the L5 by about 150 to 200 pounds of payload. Uh, so it was uh, not used a lot. It drawbacks, maintenance problems, large appetite for fuel with that big 300 horsepower radial engine. Weak points of landing gear actually would bend. When it was completely empty at zero fuel weight was uh, 3,100 pounds. And, uh, Taylor craft that flew in here today, the zero fuel weight's what? 850 pounds, and the Cub sort of similar. Uh, so that's the difference in landing in a farmer's field with what would be a 4,000 pound plane and a 1,200 pound plane. The Taylor craft is what just taxied up a minute ago. Pretty typical of these, uh, the L2, 3, and 4. 65 horsepower engine, about the size of what, a Volkswagen engine? Uh, about 1,350 made or purchased by the Army. Had a 35 foot wingspan, 22 feet, nine inch length. Empty weight there says 720, but, uh, and a gross max was 1,200 pounds. So you can see it's much less than half of the other. The range was, this was a quote, I didn't make that up, maybe 300 miles. It was actually drafted into use as a glider. The L2 and the L3 that we'll have up here was bought in numbers, and a lot of people ask, why don't they have, that's the L3 Aranka, why don't they have a big war history? <coughs> we ended up going mainly with the Piper J3 Cub variant, because we had a lot of them. Mr. Piper was, uh, well, the uh, organization was really involved in, uh, uh, what did I do with my glasses? Looking at your, your side, right, right pocket, I think. Yeah. Now you know I'm not 35 years old, right? These Piper, I want you, how many know much about Piper organization? They built a lot of airplanes. There's a lot of them out there in general aviation now. William uh, Piper was actually in with the Taylor, Taylor brothers making these things. And uh, in the 1935, they sort of split up. Mr. Piper uh, ended up buying out the Taylors and went on his own. And he had the Cub. It was a major league kind of plane. And C.J. Taylor, the mover and shaker, who ended up forming Taylor uh, Craft Aircraft Company, which who made this plane and taxi it up a minute ago, uh, he had a little bit of a disagreement. He thought he could do better than the J3 Cub. He, he envisioned a 100 mile per hour old plane like that. Uh, and the Cub, of course, is what, about 75 miles an hour, I think. So. Uh, Taylor uh, went off on his own with his brother and Taylor Craft built those. The Piper got the contract to uh, obviously sell the lion's share 
of the uh, planes, as you see up there, 5,424 of that L-4 was built for the Army Air Corps as compared to 4,200 or so for this uh, Stinson on the right-hand side. But look at the difference. They're all coming in with about a 60 for the Aronka or 65 horsepower engine. Uh, their lift capacity is, generally speaking, is about 260 pound people if you've got full fuel tanks. So they often flew alone in these things, believe it or not. And uh, the uh, usage for these things was anything you imagine. They call them the airborne jeeps. And uh, if you know much about the jeeps, I also own a World War II jeep. You used it for everything. It was an ambulance. It was a. It hauled uh, ammo. It, you name it. It hauled generals. You name it. It hauled it. Um, but if you look at the range and you look at the speeds of these, and then you come over to the Stinson, the, uh, the L5 was the only one built specifically for uh, the liaison purpose. And as a result, the L4s got out there in the Army in great numbers. And we'll see a picture of one taking off from the USS Ranger, an aircraft carrier, for Operation Torch, because that's how they got them ashore. They launched them off an aircraft carrier, which is not hard at all, because a Cub, basically, you just add power and pull back on the stick, and it's going to get in the air uh, if it's on the deck of an aircraft carrier underway. Um, and it got, the L-4 got out there and did some great work, and was really the workhorse of the artillery guys. The L-5 became a plane that was very much suited for the Pacific. One thing, these planes had to be propped. Do y'all know what propped means? They had to be started. You gotta get out in front of it and get yeah. somebody to do this to it. And uh, that's fine for a Cub, and I don't, I don't like to do that nowadays. But the Stinson, they, the Army said, we want a battery for radios and the starter. So the Stinson came, uh, you didn't have to prop it, you just push a big red button that you can see in the cockpit of the plane that I flew in, and the thing starts turning. That's a nice touch compared to propping it, in my opinion. And in a combat scenario, if one of these guys over here lands his L4 to pick up one of your buddies uh, that's wounded, uh, he may have to prop the plane, fly the plane, and do all that because he didn't have a start to. The other thing about the L5 that we'll get a little bit into is it was. Uh, had great range. Uh, it could stay in the air quite a while. As you can see, the range on it's about 300 stuff. And they did build a bunch of them. The only one built to Army specs. You could not buy this L5 uh, as a civilian until they surplused them out. And they did go into Korea, and there was another version of them that was the ambulance version. And there was one supposed to come down from PDK today. He still may be here. He said he would come. If he didn't get here by 12, he'll come. What I'm going to do is run you through some uh, slides that will emphasize certain units. There's some great books out there. I don't know whether you guys realize there's more books about aviators out there other than fighter pilots and some bomber pilots. But uh, there's uh, at least four or five really great, well-written books by guys who flew these things and did things that you just shake your head, especially if you're an aviator. You go, you got to be kidding me. But again, these two, the L4 and the L5, by far the most used, 9,000 delivered to the Army between these two. The L4, uh, or J3 Cub, was the first deployed for combat ops with the L4 being used in the uh, North African campaign. Uh, and of course, it went to the Pacific as well. The L5 had more range, more lifting power, natural choice for the Pacific. Guys, the Pacific, if any of you are Navy people, is sort of like the difference between Lake Michigan and this lake down here at the golf course off the end of the runway. In the Pacific, you're going a long ways if you're leaving the island you're on usually. And if you've ever done it, 25 miles over open ocean to an island is a long way to a pilot sometimes. But anyway, it was just better suited because of its range and its legs. So they went in mass, once they produced them in the Army and started procuring them, they went in mass. The interesting thing about the training program at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, they used the L-2 Taylor craft and the L-3 Aronka very often for two purposes. They trained, anywhere they had a training base for liaison pilots, you trained in a Taylor craft, it seemed like, or the Aronka. And then they also used those for patrol. A lot of people don't realize that just in the Gulf of Mexico, guys flying Taylorcraft and Aronkos 
uh, on a U-boat patrol off the coast, 50 miles off the coast with a plane that's got 10 gallons of gas in it when you take off. They won over 200 air medals looking for U-boats and contributed to five uh, sinkings of U-boats flying these little planes. So they did see service, but the L-2 and the L-3 just didn't go overseas for many reasons. Uh, at least not any numbers. There were some L-2s that snuck over to the Pacific, and you can see some pictures of them. This is the most deadly thing that the ladies on plane did. You're going to see pictures of Patton in one and all these things they did. But when you see this movie, this short clip you'll see in a little while, you're going to find guys who are in the movie, 85, 90 years old, who flew these things, and they'll say it was the, the most dangerous plane to the enemy of the United States of America made, counting the B-17, the B-24, or whatever. Because these guys were artillery officers. They knew how to correct artillery fire. They knew what kind of fire to put on a location. And they're, now they're above the action, bringing it in. And they, they just absolutely murdered the Japanese and the Germans. It was so bad that the Japanese basically would stop doing what they were, stop shooting most of the time and hide whenever they saw one of these planes come over. It was so bad that General Rundstedt, once we had uh, landed in France, said that he would offer a 24-hour pass back in Germany at your home for any soldier that could verify that he'd shot one of these down. The Germans were the same way. They didn't like to come out and shoot at them because you needed to hit them the first time because if you gave them a chance to call back, an artillery battery is four uh, barrels, four cannons, usually. And if it's the whole battalion shooting, there's 12. And 12 of those firing four rounds a minute are coming right down on this room. And uh, it's going to be over for you. They found hundreds of Japanese dead sometimes a day or two after these guys had called in an attack. They could hit tanks with these artillery from eight miles away. These guys were good. I mean, they were just... Absolutely, and this was the best purpose for an L bird. L5s, anything you could get up, that was the thing they were supreme at, whether it was an L4 or L5. Vince's father, we're going to have a slide about him. He flew these things, got a Silver Star, air medals, and everything. And you'll hear these guys in the film talk about how they were awesomely deadly. And you don't realize that when you watch war movies. Usually the artillery comes in, they jump in their foxholes, good or bad guys. Artillery stops and maybe somebody's died. You know, they go over and find somebody dead. When you read these books about these planes, they go into valleys where a company of Japanese troops were moving through in the jungle, covered up. Guys saw them from above. They find over 200 bodies sometimes the next day that are clearly killed by the artillery. They don't have bullet holes in them. they missing parts and all of that. So they were a pretty big deal. General Patton, seated in uh, an L5 like you see out there, this is in Germany after he got his four-star. There's lots of pictures. I've seen at least five of him sitting or standing beside L5s in France, uh, Belgium, Germany. He often used the plane to see how far his armored column was going. He would get a uh, six Charlie. You'll see that on another picture here. Was his headquarters plane, and uh, he was a pilot. He was a general aviation pilot before the war ever started. A lot of people don't realize that. Both. Eisenhower and Patton were qualified pilots. Eisenhower was the first president of the United States to be a general aviation qualified guy to be elected uh, president, in case you like trivia questions. <laughs> uh, Patton would even go out, a few choice cuss words to one of the pilots and get some maps taken to them. If you've ever seen the movie Patton, they ran off the maps. Patton would throw them in one of these planes and say, get out there and get them to those guys in the lead tanks and armored columns so they don't know where they're going. <clears throat> the, uh, that's a picture, not of Patton's plane, but like one he owned. Uh, he owned a Stinson Voyager, and Patton used it often before the war in uniform to go places and be in front of his troops. He knew where he was sending his columns, and he would go land in front of them and be standing there with his hands on his hips these guys have driven at 25 miles an hour for three hours and they're wondering how their general got in front of them. <laughs> and uh, that's why. He owned a plane like this and flew it quite often. Uh, something you just don't know about Patton, I guess. It wasn't uh, important enough to make the movie. 
he really sought the L5. The conjecture is that he was the one who convinced the Army to get Stinson to make an L5 specifically for the Army because he had owned the Stinson. And that's not me just coming up with that. That's sort of the written deal. Uh, and he used it and abused it. He flew in the L5 all the time, and that's why there's so many pictures and allusion to it. Uh, here's a picture of him beside Six Charlie as a three star, and he's talking with Omar Bradley. And you can probably assume the L5 behind it is the one Bradley came in. Patton was a big man, six foot two. You can't find his weight, usually. Not that that's important, but probably 6'2", 220 is what a lot of people would think. And when you get in a cub at 6'2", 220, you need an 11-year-old boy flying in the other seat. Uh, because you're a little bit heavy if you've got a 220-pound man in there. Uh, this is some more pictures. One, uh, he doesn't look too happy there. Again, in an L5, and this is him over here conferring again, just outside. This is during the war. Eisenhower was no... Uh, Coward, he would ride in the L4 because that's a picture of Eisenhower in the back seat of an L4. This is another one of the more famous pilots that flew L birds. And uh, Major J.T. Walker was Mark Clark's pilot. Anybody know what Mark Clark's fame was? He was the guy who commanded all of the American troops that went up Italy and uh, thus the Rome Express. This is an L4 that Walker landed in the top of a tree with. And as it says there, if you're over a forest and you can't find a farmer's field and you're gonna have to land, you just get your L4 slow enough and sort of flare it and land in the top of the tree and hope it don't come down. You can worry about climbing down, all little boys climb anyway. And that he survived that L4, you know, landing in the tree like that on purpose. Uh, one of the things Walker did was fly just about everybody important. Anybody that came into the Mediterranean theater, uh, he flew uh, all of the four stars and the big wigs that came in to see him, He, Mark Clark, and he were buddies. Uh, his luck ran out. He didn't live to the end of the war. And you would think, as Patton said, you know, bullet, you know, something, these real warriors will Walker was uh, leaving in February 1945. He was leaving the Italian campaign for a week to get to see his family for the first time in three years. He got on a C-47 with several other guys to be taken to a place uh, in England, I, I would assume. I didn't read that part, but his family had come over so he could see his children, and the plane crashed, killed all aboard on the transport. So you survive all of this, and uh, when it's your time, it's your time, I guess. But uh, quite the guy. There's a lot written about Walker. This is just showing, uh, picking up a message. These two guys here are holding up two poles with a string between it. You fly by and you pick up a message. The L4s especially, uh, the L5s as well, had a bag that was a weighted bag. They could actually drop a message down to guys, fly over and, and drop it down if you had time to write it or if you had another guy with you. And uh, that's what it says, they had message drop back, so they could pick something up. The 25th Liaison Squadron is the most storied liaison squadron in the Pacific Theater. And uh, I want to point out, if you served in the military, the liaison squadrons are different from the artillery guys. In a typical infantry division, you've got three battalions of uh, artillery. Each battalion would get two L4s. This is a very typical European thing and a lot of times Pacific as well. Headquarters artillery would get two more, so they'd have eight L4s in infantry division. And uh, then you had liaison squadrons. And uh, the, the 25th liaison squadron worked under the 5th Air Force and the 13th Air Force out in the Pacific. 32 planes in a liaison squadron. Two ways of handling it. In Europe, they generally, if they had a liaison squadron, they gave each corps eight of the liaison squadron planes, and then headquarters for the corps kept eight, and that comes out to usually 32 planes. They fought a lot of times out of one or two bases with these out there, but if you've been in the military, the people flying these planes are 60% staff sergeants, 40% 01s and 02s. 
if you've been in the military, who can you not be sure you're going to tell to do something and they're going to have a better idea sometimes and do what they like to do? Well, sergeants are going to say, sure, major, and they're going to go do whatever the heck they want to do because they know better anyway. They're sergeants. And second lieutenants think they're way smarter than they really are. And that's who you've got flying these planes. So the things they did is really bizarre. <laughs> The Guinea Short Lines is what's on the plane out there. That became their nickname. Short Lines were short range airlines that flew a lot in the late 30s that would take you from, say, Atlanta to Macon. That would be a short line thing. And they were in Guinea, New Guinea. They formed in Northern Australia. Interesting story, when they were forming with all these pilots, you had sergeants and second lieutenants, started building up their L-5s and Senior officers, majors, lieutenant colonels, and captains kept stealing them because they were at a bomber base. There were fighters around as well. And these guys, if they weren't flying, they said, let's just go get one of those little planes. And the guy goes, well, they're not ours. They said, well, there's an E-5 in it, you know? So they were ordering guys out of the planes. The guys would taxi out to go fly these E-5s, and there would be a major pull up in a Jeep and block their path and say, the major wants to fly. And he'd get the sergeant out of his plane in his squadron and the major would fly. Well, the captain, the O3, who was the commanding officer of the 25th Liaison, went to the deputy commander of the 5th Air Force and said, this ain't going to work. And they backed him up. He said, I want all the planes returned because they had assembled like 18 of them, only had four sitting on the line. They were all over the place. And he said, if you don't get all those planes in here in about 24 hours, heads are going to roll. So they started flying them back in so they could reform. So the makeup of liaison squadrons is very unique. <clears throat> That's an early picture. Guinea Short Lines is already on there. They worked with the Australians in New Guinea a tremendous amount. That's why the, the uh, kangaroo. And uh, this is an early New Guinea campaign because the tail's not white and it doesn't have a Philippine green gold stripes on the tail or on the wing, which you'll see on this one. My plane out there is painted in 25th Liaison Squadron, Philippines campaign. You might know why they painted the tail white later on? You can find them. And the Japanese weren't a problem. It wasn't like, well, the Japs will see us. It's like, well, the Japs weren't coming. By the time we got to mid-1943 and 1944, every time the Japs came down from Rabaul to mess around in New Guinea, they just got beat up. Whether they brought 30 or 40 zeros, they'd go back with three and they realized we can't go down to New Guinea and offer a bother anymore. And so they weren't going to be shot down by the Japanese other, other than a rifleman. And remember I told you, they, they went in a hole. They didn't want to bring the artillery down. So anyway, this young man in New Guinea. This is the appearance of the white tail. This picture was taken in Wa. I guess that's how you would pronounce it. That airfield is up here in New Guinea, and of course we went across, MacArthur basically took the army and went up the north side of New Guinea there, pushing the Japanese off, and then from New Guinea, once they had that campaign completed, he went back and kept his promise to go back to the Philippines. But while airfield here, as you can see, white tails on the planes, those are L-5s, one of them is, but the other one looks like, I'm not sure what it is, but they're not L-5s, but they all had white tails. So they were putting white tails on a lot of planes in the Pacific theater that we don't hear about because it's easy to find you if you go down. <clears throat> Just like somebody said. They even uh, doctored up the ambulance. As you can see, there's a kangaroo on that ambulance there. This was another big use for the liaison squadrons. They, uh, they were big time, and this is not the ambulance version. They put a wounded guy in the back seat and get him out. They'd land anywhere. Peaches were great. They had to get in and get out before the tide changed sometimes because water you needed to have the beach hard part. If any of y'all go to the beach often, and not water. You got to where the water was coming in, you got some problems. You couldn't land in the soft sand because you go over your nose. But anyway, officers uh, uh, usually were, uh, a lot of the senior officers were flown around from the headquarters assigned planes and uh, you had a captain or a major quite often that would fly some of these, but mostly lieutenants and staff sergeants flying these things around. This is where I talk about there's eight of them attached to a core 
a core is usually three or four divisions. So a core can usually have about 50 to 70,000 troops in it. That's another picture of an L5 uh, with no white tail over the jungles of New Guinea. It's a typical theater photo of an L5, uh, an L4 pilot beside his steed, probably the Philippines campaign. They flew the HEWL out of these planes. If you read these books, I'm going to give you the bibliography about a couple of them are great books. They flew these things sometimes. There would be two planes and two pilots, and they would alternate in these cubs. And uh, they would each do four missions a day. So they'd get eight missions out if they were spotting for artillery. And they would do that sometimes for five to eight days straight. There's a story in one of the books, uh, the low and slow book that I'll tell you about in a minute, where the guy said that he took a colonel out, and it was the most fortuitous thing he did. This lieutenant colonel wanted to go. He was a staffer. He wanted to go out in the L-4, and when he took off and they started climbing out, two pieces of fabric tore off the right wing and fell to the earth like handkerchiefs. They just came off. Big pieces. He describes them as being three feet across each one of them. Caused the plane to yaw. He kept the plane airborne, you know, and they get back in. And the colonel said, how old are these planes? And he said, that's the only planes we've had out here for three years in the Pacific. We had them in Hawaii, and we've had them wherever we've been. And they started looking at them, and, and the, uh, you got one and a half maintenance man for every two plane detachment. So you had a, uh, an AMP who could do power plants and airframes work, and then you had a guy like me. Uh, actually, I guess you could say I'm a pilot, but you know, you had one, a, a guy that could only fuel the thing and maybe knew what a screwdriver versus a wrench was, and that was your two guys that kept the two planes flying. They could patch the fabric, but they didn't know how to recover. Well, anyway, that colonel flew, and uh, he came back and said, you guys should get new planes, to which the young second lieutenant artillery officer said, yes, sir, we think so, too. <laughs> and about a day later, they got word to go down to Manila, and uh, they had uh, about six crates of new L-4s for, for them because they had just flown the wings off of them. And uh, <clears throat> so they, they flew these things hard. One guy says he believes he got 2,000 hours in 14 months. Now in a Cub, that's a lot of time. We had some guys fly up a couple weeks ago for World War II Heritage Days from Pensacola, and they were about ready to give up the ghost just flying it up from Pensacola. Of course, they were all over 60 and all that, but it was hot. You're going along at 72 miles an hour. And, uh, of course, they fly like a leaf, if you've ever seen Forrest Gump. An L, to me, an L-4 sort of flies like this, you know. It's just like anything that's out there, you know, sometimes a bird will breathe and the, the plane will <laughs> They're great planes. I, mean, I love the planes. Uh, the, the L-4s and the Taylor Craft are great. Uh, I have to say things like that because mine drinks so much more fuel that I have to pay for uh, this is the Pacific Coast for the Marine Corps here. Uh, this is Major Tom Rosga, and that is bazookas. And uh, the Navy got a bunch of the L-5s, and they're designated OI-1s. The Navy designates planes differently. And the Marine Corps called it a VMO. Of course, V is uh, Naval Force, M is Marine Corps, and O was for observation. The Marines didn't come up with this idea if you read about it, until early 43 when they saw what the Army was doing and a young Marine captain said, we ought to do this. And he told some colonel that before you know it, the Navy was out saying, can you get us some of those planes for the Marine Corps? They had six of these squadrons out in the Pacific. Tom Roscoe was a commanding officer of VMO-4, the squadron, and during Saipan and Iwo Jima, he mounted bazookas under the wings and shot it at the Japanese. Uh, He's very frank about things. About four years ago, uh, Roska was up at Oshkosh, and uh, they did an interview with him. And he, uh, uh, he has since passed away, I hate to say, but uh, he talked a lot about this episode. He said, I didn't hit a damn thing. But he said, it was good to be throwing something back at him and watching it explode in the mud. And uh, he realized that his his most uh, powerful weapon was to call in naval gunfire support or something. 
from the guys offshore because they can bring up a lot of stuff in a hurry. And if you've got a good guy like him directing it, it comes out pretty good. But anyway, he mounted bazookas. Now, Marines, if I'm a Navy guy, and it's very common for us to say Marines aren't that smart. But these guys were smart enough, they propped the tail up and fired the bazookas on the ground to make sure it didn't set the tail on fire. Because these are rockets coming out of tubes, and one of them said, won't that set the tail on fire? So they tried it, and it didn't. And then he flew this way for those uh, two battles. And Lady Satan is actually a, a paint scheme. Uh, it has survived the war. And you can see Lady Satan today if you go to the right place. I'm not exactly sure where it's hanging right now, but uh, Roscoe was able to see Lady Satan before he died about five years ago. And he did an interview, and he actually signed two or three of the old birds inside on the fabric at, people, at the owner's request. This is a carrier takeoff by an L-4. We talked about that earlier. When we went into uh, the, our first offensive action in Europe was at uh, North Africa, and we went in and uh, jumped off uh, the carriers, and they weren't meant to come back and land. They were going to take off the carriers and land in North Africa, and that's what they did. And as you well know, uh, this thing lifts off at what? Well, what's an L? What's a Cub take off at? 40 miles an hour? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so you get a little wind across the deck. And all these guys here, it's not like they're saying, man, let's watch it. These are guys, this is an operation. This is a major Operation Torch was going on. And we're launching these little bitty planes off to go spot initially. But just shows the flexibility and amazing things you can do. They were meant to land anywhere, as we've talked about. That's one coming down the road there. You can tell it's not a runway. If it is, it's not an airport field I'm going to voluntarily. And this is Baku Pass. I mean, is that the way you pronounce it, Mo? I don't. That's the way it was spelled in the book. It's in Italy, and that's a little jump ramp down there. There's an L bird sitting there, and it's in the mountains in Italy somewhere. And that's just an example of some of the places these guys operated out of. You can see by the size of the plane, and then look at the runway. That, that they don't have a lot of runway to use. This is the European theater version of the Marine with the bazookas. This is Bazooka Charlie. Now, he became quite the hero because I think he sort of wanted to be. You know, some people adapt to that and really take it on. Patton probably was a little bit that way. But he put bazookas on his, and he actually got, he was decorated. And uh, if you read the story here, he, uh, before it was all over, he had destroyed officially six tanks, German tanks with bazookas from his plane. And if you think that's silly, there is a story in one of the books that I'll give you the bibliography where the guy actually landed. He couldn't get their attention that there was a Panther tank in the way of this battalion that was coming, one of those spotters. So he landed over near them, and they said, well, we don't have anything. Uh, we, we don't have a bazooka or anything here. So he got a jerry can full of gas and a thermite grenade and attached it to it and put it in the back seat of his L4. And when he flew over the, the Panther, he dropped it out the door and it blew up and set the tank on fire so again guys you, the stories when you read these books are pretty incredible they had black pilots a lot of people think that they only flew the tuskegee airmen only flew these guys went through a little bit different training program but you know as you well know you had black units of battalion they kept them together a lot of times you'd have a black regiment or a black battalion and you had uh, as it turns out the 333rd artillery battalion is a black battalion uh, Frank was in the infantry battalion so he needed uh, Elbert pilots who were black and this guy with the cool aviator shades uh, just shows you that uh, they didn't just fly <clears throat> low and slow with the armored columns that's the way Patton liked to have them there as you can see those Sherman tanks uh, that guy is probably not on final there he's just down being with them I don't know this is a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek thing. An L5 celebrates his victory over a ME-262. This is late in the war. I'm sure we're in Germany somewhere, and this is a crashed one that he's flying over. This is for Frank Forth. He's going to tell you in a minute a couple uh, stories about being in the Battle of Bulge. The Belgian winter wasn't real kind to the troops, and it wasn't for the old birds either. That's a picture of one sitting there in the cold that, that Frank's going to share one of his stories about. Uh, they were often close to the front lines. Elberts a lot of times were within five miles of the front lines because they would, they would usually put them somewhere near the artillery battalion if they were 
supporting and they would it's funny because they would get far enough away that the guns didn't bother them as much in other words they'd try to find them a field a half mile down the road because you didn't want those guns going off in your house near your house which was a tent for those guys it's a picture of one landing on a road and uh, landing on roads they did a lot but it's especially good if you got friendly guys down there Willard might allude to that when he gets to the L-19 story this one's also got a funny marking on it if you're a military affection not it looks like there's a red stripe inside there uh, emblem on the side would that mean that this is Korean War? I don't know I think so sometimes there were large numbers it's a whole field full of uh, L-4s uh, but oftentimes they were they were paired up. This actually happened. This is an artist rendition. There wasn't anybody snap a, a cell phone shot of it. But perhaps the last dogfight, the last day or two of the war, these two guys were out in their L4, and they shot down a German Feisler Stork with a 45 service pistol. <laughs> They shot him down. Now, the plane didn't blow up like you see in the movies, and they actually landed with it. The Germans were apparently uh, not that disappointed. <laughs> War was over, and they were happy to probably get good food and be out of the mess. This brings us up to uh, Vince Garland's one of our members here. He's going to offer a comment or two. This is his father, Major Max Garland. Uh, and uh, he, was, he enlisted in the Army was assigned to horse artillery. Does that sound familiar to you, Frank? Yes, it does. They must have put everybody in horse artillery. Well, we didn't have enough trucks and they do it. In World War II, he applied to become a liaison, liaison pilot in the field artillery, and after getting his wings, he was assigned to fly L-4s, later would fly to L-5. His artillery unit in Europe was a battalion equipped with a 155 millimeter long tom. That's a six inch diameter shell. Long toms are, are a little more range than some of the 105s and short barrel 155s. And uh, Max was awarded a silver star, a bronze star, and 19 air medals. So he probably did just as goofy a thing as all these other guys we talked about <laughs> as far as getting down really low to the enemy and calling in the support. After Korea, uh, Major Garland instructed at Fort Rucker and Fort Sill. Fort Sills were, since that's the uh, Army-wise, that's the artillery. Site, and they trained the artillery pilots out at Fort Sill. They trained them to land on curved roads. You'll see that in the film. We'll get 10 or 15 minutes of the film here. And that's uh, First Lieutenant Max Garland in front of this grasshopper. Do you want to say anything? I think he's going to tell you a quick war story or two. So growing up in the house with a guy who did all this crap. Vince is a pilot as well. He, at one time he was the senior pilot at AirTran, I think, before he retired. So. And he was a military pilot. Thank you, Steve. <coughs> Steve was in the Navy. Is this, is this the volume good for you? The back? He was in the Navy, and I was in the Air Force, the Air National Guard, and the Air Force Reserve for 28 years. <clears throat> and I had the privilege of following, uh, not intentionally, but it just worked out that way. Sometimes the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree. In the footsteps of my father, Max, who uh, was an Army aviator in World War II. It's interesting about the Army. Um, you're probably all familiar with the Air Force wings, what they look like, and the shield in the center of the, of the wings that have uh, vertical lines. Well, he was a liaison pilot, so his wings were like that. As a matter of fact, Steve is wearing a pair on the flight suit. We get a chance to, to, to talk with him, we'll show you what they look like. And it had a big L on the top of the shield, which stood for liaison pilot. So Dad enlisted in the Army in 1935 out of uh, Billings, Montana, was at Fort, uh, Gosh, what's the fort up there in Seattle? Anybody remember? Fort Lewis, thank you so much. Uh, I have trouble remembering last Tuesday sometimes. Fort Lewis, and uh, December the 7th of 41 came along. He enlisted in 35 with the horse artillery. And every, somebody comes in and shouts, hey, Pearl Harbor's been attacked. And everybody says, what the heck is Pearl Harbor? <laughs> well, they find out real quick. So uh, he started out as enlisted. Uh, he wound up... Uh, getting a commission and was in oh, field artillery and was at uh, Fort Meade in, in field artillery where, where he met my mother. And then he went to a flight school and he did a primary uh, as a part of the civilian uh, training program that they had in the U.S. at that time, where the first stage of everybody's training was accomplished 
at a civilian flight school with civilian instructors. And he did his training in St. Joplin, Missouri. And I guess he was probably in the L3, possibly the L4. And then from there he went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where he got his advanced training and then from there went overseas. An inter interesting anecdote about my dad is that I never really had a lot of particulars about what organization he served with. Now I was an Army brat. Uh, he retired from the Army when I was uh, in third grade and then he stayed uh, civil service at Fort Rucker, Alabama, which was the Army Aviation Center. So I grew up as an Army kid and always aspired to be in the Army. My first flight was with him in Cheyenne, Wyoming at three and a half in an L-17 Navion. And uh, he was attached to the, uh, uh, the uh, Wyoming National Guard. And he took me up. And I remember vividly flying over uh, Cheyenne, a little anxious and looking down, and I can still see the colors of all of the tiling on the homes, reds and browns and greens and oranges. Never forgot that. And there's a picture of me at home sitting as a little tyke on the left leading the edge of the wing, and, you know, three and a half, I'm about that tall, in a little suit with a hat on. And I never forget that flight. So I can remember as a young kid saying, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to be just like my dad. And I guess I was. Uh, so, make a long story short, I got into aviation, and most of my tactical flying career was as what we call today a FAC forward air controller. The forward air controller is um, another iteration of the liaison work that was done by the Army aviators in World War II. As a matter of fact, we have four guys here in the organization that uh, were FACs. Uh, Willard Womack, our, our co-host, uh, flew L-19s in Southeast Asia, South Vietnam with the Army. My dad flew that also in Korea. And then uh, George Harrison flew the O-1, which was the Air Force version of the L-19, well, the Air Force in Southeast Asia. And then Bob Grove, Rob, are you still in here? Uh, Bob Grove flew the O-2, which we call the Duck, and he flew that in Southeast Asia. And I flew as a FAC and an ALO, an Air Liaison Officer, that's a that's a, a, an Air Force guy who's blue, attached to an Army outfit who's green, who speaks Army and has a radio and a rifle and a pistol and a Jeep and helps call in tactical air support to destroy an Army maneuver unit that's engaged with our people. So I did that for a year, but for 12 years I was a FAC, a forward air controller, so I had the most FAC experience of anybody in the unit. And I didn't have the privilege of flying the L-19, but I did fly uh, the O-2, and which was a Cessna 337. Anybody know what that was? The push me, pull me, an engine in the front, an engine in the back, and two booms like a P-38 Lightning. So I flew that, and then the A-37, and then finally the A-10, primarily as a forward air controller. So we would carry, in addition to either a machine gun, a cannon, or bombs, we would also carry uh, rockets, 2.75 inch rockets that we would fire, and they had Willie Pete or white phosphorus warheads that would mark the target, and then the, uh, the air power that we were controlling would roll in on the target and we would co correct, you know, okay, uh, another tank, 50 meters to your left, you know, you're cleared in hot, that sort of thing. But that's an outgrowth of what my dad did in World War II. He got to Europe about uh, two months after D-Day, which was June of 44, and he was an L-4 grasshopper pilot and also flew the L-5 Stinson, and then in Korea he flew the L-19 bird dog. <clears throat> so, uh, it, by chance, about a week ago, Tom Lee, who isn't with us today, who's a, a member of the unit, has a, an L-4 grasshopper with the D-Day invasion stripes, the black and white stripes that you see so prominent. If you look overhead, you'll see several of these airplanes, they're probably in the back, that have the invasion stripes, the P-47s back there. That was so that we could, uh, there you go, right up there, the, the Mustang. So that uh, our guys could be identified by the guys on the ground and not get shot down, hopefully. So, uh, he was over in Europe, and he was flying the L-4, and this fellow that I met, Tom Lee, happened to say, I overheard his conversation talking about his grasshopper, and I said, you've got a grasshopper? He said, yeah, that's what he called the L-4. I said, my dad flew those in Europe. He said, really, give me his name. So we started a correspondence, and by golly, he's one of these Ancestry.com kind of guys. Within a week, he had all of this information on my father that I didn't know about. So the unit that I never knew, and uh, we're even working on getting the citation to a Silver Star to find out why he was awarded it. As it turns out, I found out 
who told them that there were 10 garlands in the United States Army during World War II that were awarded the Silver Star. Now, Garland is not a very common name, so I was surprised about that, and some of them may even have been related to my father. But uh, he was uh, in the Third Army, which was commanded by General Patton. He saw him uh, several times, and of course he was old blood and guts. He had a real high-pitched, squeaky voice. He sounded like a girl. And to make his uh, persona more authoritative, he cussed like a sailor because he had to make up for his girly sounding voice. And he also had a temper. And uh, I can remember him telling me some stories. He said, you saw General Patton coming. You moved away. <laughs> you don't want to get in his line of fire. So he was a fiery guy, but a, a terrific wartime leader and our best, and that's the kind you want. Uh, guys like that don't survive in peacetime because they're not political, but if you want somebody that's going to break things and kill the enemy, that's the kind of guy you want at the front of the troops. So my father was in Third Army, commanded by General Patton. He was in the 12th Corps, and there were three corps that made up an army, and he was in 12th, and he was in field artillery. He was a field artillery officer before he started flying. And um, he was attached to the headquarters battery of uh, 12th Corps. Now, they had, uh, at least with my father, he was paired with an observer. And this was Lieutenant Hightower. My dad was Lieutenant Garland. They flew as a team in the L-4, and they had a radio. Remember, uh, Steve was talking about they wanted a starter, a battery, and a radio. And Hightower was the observer, and he would fly in the back with his map. And my father would be piloting the aircraft in the front. They'd carry grenades with them. They'd wear their steel pot and a parachute, and they would go out over the forward edge of the battle area, which we call the FIBA, and they would look for trouble. And when they found the trouble, now these, the bad guys are on the other side of the line, let's say they're in the second row, and the forward edge of our guys are right here. He would go beyond the forward advance of our troops looking for targets of opportunity. With the radio, they were directly in contact with the field artillery batteries. And uh, if you know anything about the Army, they will have what they call FOs or forward observers. These guys would go out in advance with the radio, they'd be on the ground looking with binoculars for the enemy and calling the targets in. Well, he was with a Long Tom unit. The Long Tom was a towed 155, 155 millimeter gun, big long barrel. As a matter of fact, it's, the caliber of the round was 6.1 inches in diameter, and I think they could throw that shell something like 12 miles. Oddly enough, in World War II, the Navy had cruisers. We all know about battleships and carriers. But the cruisers were light cruisers and heavy cruisers. A light cruiser was equip equipped with a 6.1 inch gun. That's what the Army was towing out there on the battlefield. Heavy cruisers had eight inch guns. Battleships, 14 and 16. So it was a big weapon. And it was crewed and it was towed. And he'd be in contact by radio with the battery. And they would call for fire. And hey, we got a target. He'd give the grid coordinates. Okay, the round's on the way. And then they would correct the round. Okay, you're 100 meters right and 300 meters short. And he's, they're probably flying 100, 200 feet above the enemy. And weaving and bobbing and up and down so they don't get hit. And uh, they would destroy the target. So I was a military kid. I used to wear a an army gold belt buckle that I polished. And uh, my dad, dad taught me how to use the M1 rifle and the manual of arms and everything like that. I was hardcore all the way. I guess I still am. <clears throat> so I built model airplanes from the same time I was five. So it's a rainy Saturday afternoon like today, and we're sitting in the kitchen. And dad's got, his favorite blend was old granddad. So he's got his, his bourbon there, and he's smoking a cigarette. <laughs> Always hung out of the corner of his mouth. And uh, he didn't smoke until I was born. Uh, but uh, he's sitting there with his knees crossed. He said, like this. He said, something that I ever tell me about that time I got those five tiger tanks. And I say, no, sir, <laughs> I haven't heard that story. He said, just a minute. So he walks down to the hall closet, and he pulls out this map of Europe. I didn't know what was in there. And I'm probably about 10. And we're sitting at the table, <clears throat> and Dad takes that map and rolls it out like this, and I'm sitting here. I think I was working on probably, it might have been the long time, I don't know, but I built everything. Airplanes and, and army uh, weapons and tanks and trucks and stuff. 
And we're looking, he said, yeah, it was right about here. Yeah, that was it. I don't remember the name of the time. He says, well, Hightower and I were flying, and we saw these tigers. Now, a tiger was a vicious foe. We really feared it. The tiger of the panther tanks. And he said, uh, yep, there they are, five of them. And our guys were not too far from where they were. They were coming this way, and we were going that way. So they called in fire with the 155s, and he destroyed those five tanks and saved a lot of guys. And he said, he stayed as a part of the Army of Occupation in Europe after the war, and I was born there in 48. And we didn't leave Europe until 49. He said, after the war, I drove back through that town, and those five Tiger tanks that we killed were still there. So I said, wow, that's pretty exciting. Another time, he and, Ty he and Hightower were out flying, and they flew low. You know, they're looking for trouble. They want, like Steve was saying, the Japs found out, they were called Japs then. The Japs found out that these guys were serious trouble, so everybody lay low. So Dad and, and Hightower are out there, and they find this, these, these uh, Vermont troops down there, and they're all kind of hunkered down and hiding, because they knew what these grasshopper guys were. They were trouble with a capital T. Well, one guy couldn't resist, so he, jumped out of his fighting position, they were all squatting down, and Dad saw him, and he had an MP40, which was a submachine gun, nine millimeter submachine gun. There's one out there, I believe, in the museum, or a re replica of one, and he goes <laughs> like that, and hoses off maybe 20 rounds, and all of a sudden, high says, ah, I'm hit, I'm hit, and they heard a pop. Well, what happened is, that round went through the fabric of the aircraft, split the pants seam on Hightower's trousers, went up through his parachute, hold the parachute, out through the radio, blew the radio up. He thought he was dead. <laughs> you can imagine. He felt a little stinging, I guess. That close, quarter of an inch, he'd have been mort. They got back there. <laughs> I can only imagine. Hightower probably had to have a restorative after that story. So those are the kinds of things they did. Now Steve mentioned about the fact that, you know, they had the L-19 and they flew that in, uh, in Korea. My dad flew that in Korea and did a tour over there. And uh, he was replaced after that tour and a new liaison pilot came in and my father said, now look, you gotta be tactical, you gotta bob and weave out here. You can't fly straight and level. You got a map in your hand, you know, get behind a hill, up and down, left and right, so they can't hit you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dad went home, and that fellow had, had his aircraft, and probably within about four or five days was dead because he was hit by a 37 millimeter round that blew him to smithereens because he wasn't bobbing and weaving. So uh, they did what they had to do to survive. It was a very hairy environment they were in. My dad at that time was a little bit older than most of the guys. He was only 26. And uh, at the end of the war, 27, so he was an old guy. A lot of these guys were like 19, 20, 22, especially. Frank, how old were you at the bottom of the bulge? 21. 21. He was, you were probably one of the guys they called Pops. Exactly. Because everybody else was like 19 year old, you know. Gosh, just started shaving. And now they got to kill somebody with an M1 or be killed. So that guy didn't bob and weave and he didn't live. So it was a, a very hairy mission, but uh, my father was a real war fighter. He was on the edge all the time. And um, he was awarded the Silver Star, which is the third highest uh, combat medal that uh, a serviceman can be awarded. You got the Congressional Medal of Honor. I think you have either the Air Force or the Navy Cross. I don't know what the Army had at that time. And then you've got the Silver Star Medal. Right. And then uh, a Bronze Star Medal for Valor. And then actually I think he had 19 plus the original Air Medal, so 20 Air Medals, which spanned Korea and of course all the way back to World War II. So a real war fighter, a real privilege <clears throat> growing up with him, and as a result of his influence, I wound up doing the same mission a generation later for about 13 years. So exciting stuff. Uh, these guys were all heroes. I was talking with Frank earlier, who's 93, and he said, I'm not a hero. I said, Frank, you're one of the great members of the greatest generation and there aren't many of you left, so why don't you just consider yourself to be a hero representing all of the heroes who went before? Because anybody who served that conflict was a cut above, let me tell you. So anyway, that's my personal story. There's a picture of my father, and uh, he was a real warrior, and it was a privilege being his son.
great job. Close connection with this. Uh, we're going to get on, and we're, uh, just to give you what we're doing here, this is not going to last all day. Hopefully, you're, some of you are enjoying it enough. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit here with uh, uh, Frank and uh, give you a little bit of history behind him. Then we have a few minutes. We'll watch the actual thing with uh, Cliff Robertson. As I, you'll see these planes flying and doing that. Then you can go outside. It is sprinkling rain off and on. Maybe it's stopped now. So it wasn't a good time to be out looking at the planes a few minutes ago anyway. Frank uh, Forth is a young man that uh, I didn't meet until a couple weeks back in World War II Heritage Days. He was at the swing dance. We started talking with him a little bit. He was a member of the uh, Rail Splitters, the 84th Infantry Division, which got thrown into the battle in Europe. Uh, and he was also a 333rd uh, Infantry Regiment member. He was an artillery man, an enlisted man. Some of the things that he'll tell you when you have uh, breakfast with him like I was privileged to do is, is it's just doggone interesting uh, to talk with Frank. Uh, he was born in Corner Gorda, Florida, about 100. Birmingham, Alabama, and lived in Corner Gorda. Lived in uh, Corner Gorda, Florida, about 100 yeah. miles south of uh, St. Petersburg. I mean, uh, Tampa area. Uh, he said he used to run out in the yard when he would see a plane when he was just a young boy, just like many people will say, whether it's Chuck Yeager or whoever. Uh, he is very quick to say, just like Ben said, he's not a hero. Uh, Frank was, uh, there was a little bit of misprinting in what we did. He was an artillery man who's familiar with the L4s and the L5s, but when he applied to try to go into the, the, the uh, training uh, as the, the war ended and fly and do his dream, uh, they, they said his eyes wasn't quite what they wanted. Of course, you're downsizing in the Army, so he, did, he didn't get to actually be the pilot of the L4 or the L5. But he's got some good stories. We're going to ask him a couple questions and let him share uh, those with you. He was a horse artilleryman, too, in, down in Florida. He was a member of the University of Florida, ROTC. And that's sort of where he was at as a young man when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, he was known as Stormy by the guys around him. I don't know what that means. And he, I said, what did you do most of the time? And he said, KP. <laughs> And uh, he's, he's a funny guy, and I'm going to try to ask him a couple questions. And uh, He was uh, up in uh, Europe, and uh, the other thing that, about Frank that you need to know is if you're ever over at Mimi's over here, go sit around Frank if you want to have a lot of girls and women come around. Uh, I was there having breakfast with him, and I didn't see a female from the age of 20 to 60 that didn't, that didn't come in and come and kiss him on the forehead, kiss him somewhere. One young lady was brought up and introduced to him that looked like she was in her early 20s, and uh, she's from Paris. So uh, Frank starts talking French, and I'm not talking about just parlez-vous français. I mean, uh, Frank speaks the language. He speaks several languages. Uh, I call him a linguist. He's got a talent in that regard. About five or six languages that you maybe four better. Four, four good, arguably. which is three more than me. Arguably, arguably four. Uh, he nearly froze to death in the Battle of Bulls. We'll have him tell you a little bit about that. But uh, he was uh, a young man who flew airplanes. Though he bought an airplane as soon as uh, when the war ended. I think he said for eight. He bought an L4 for eight hundred dollars. Yeah. So if you can get one today for $800 and you don't want it, call me up. Um, even if it doesn't have a cover on it, I'll take the carcass for $800. And uh, why don't you tell them, uh, I tell you what, first of all, we've been talking about Vince, talked about his dad. We walked up to him at swing dance and said, Frank, do you still know how to call in artillery fire? And in about 1.2 seconds, he started calling in artillery fire. So do you still remember how to do that? Do you want me to do it now? Yes, sir, if you wouldn't mind. Here's a, here's a microphone. Battery adjust. Shell H E. Charge five. Fuse quick. Base deflection right. One, two, zero. On number two, open two. Number two, fire for position. Battery, fire for effect. <laughs> <laughs> He doesn't have to rehearse that because I didn't tell him any of the questions I would ask him, but I saw him do it out here 
uh, on the swing dance floor uh, just off the cuff and somebody said, can you still call in artillery fire? And he just, boom, he went into it. Now he was given, uh, as an artilleryman, he carried uh, a carbine, a 30 caliber carbine. It's lighter, it's shorter, and that's what they gave the troops like that. But he ended up sort of on the front lines when the Germans decided to open up the Battle of the Belgian Bulge. And it was quite cold and all that, and they handed Frank an M1 Garand, which is heavy and big, and he's sitting there in his overcoat. Can you describe your coldest moment when you thought it was about over for you, uh, when you were up there cold and there was somebody pulled up beside you unexpectedly and, and gave you uh, a new lease on life? Well, my new lease on life was, uh, it was cold. <laughs> Even the clothes on our bodies, all of us, the clothes were frozen. And uh, being from South Florida, that was a little bit tough. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, we made it, those of us. We did a lot of praying, and we got a lot of help. I can remember a Sherman tank pulling up very near to me. I was in the Ardennes Forest, leaning up against a tree, and the Sherman tank pulled up. They didn't see me. They got out and uh, built a very small, and started making coffee. That odor of that coffee, I'll never forget it. But they said, one of them spotted me and they said, would you like some coffee? Dear friends, if they had offered me a million dollars, I would have taken the coffee. <laughs> but things were good. I guess it was that our Lord just wasn't ready for me. But after the war, I came out uh, with a disability, and but actually was recalled into the Korean conflict, and uh, got through that all right. But I had my own airstrip. I was so fortunate enough to own an L4, and loved that little bird with all my heart. It was real good. But I've had a lot of fun flying. It's been great. My son over there knows all about it. Uh, he used to lamp, hang out the, the window and take pictures of the forest areas, which I was appraising. My civilian MOS is a forester, and I love it. But uh, anyhow, that's about all I can say about myself. Thank God I'm here. <laughs> Frank's a real gentleman, and he's going to be around in a few minutes after this. If you want to come talk with him, shake his hand. But he, he you just don't call him a zero, uh, a hero, not a zero. Uh, don't call him a hero because he's liable to get uh, a little uh, upset with that. Um, but he's he's a real jewel of a gentleman, and we're just glad he could be here with us today. And uh, he said he wants to get his hand on the stick of an L4, L5 again uh, here in the next few days and we're going to make that happen. We may not do it today, but we're going to set that up, get some pictures and get you up in either one or both if you I want to. That. And uh, he'll show us how to uh, perhaps fly. But uh, we're going to move along. We're going to turn it over finally to Willard Womack. Uh, Willard says, I have a short and a long one. And I said, Willard, I'm prejudiced. I've heard Willard speak many times. He's a guy that often tours school groups, takes them through. He's going to be the, the 8th Air Force, I think it is. Uh, I just love hanging around him because he's a great mechanic, but he's flown about 45 different airplanes, literally, and I mean that means landing them, not just been in them. And uh, I would take his long version, so I said, I'm going to tell you to do a shorter long version of what you've got. But Willard went to Vietnam at an interesting time before the buildup had occurred. He's got some nice slides here that will show you what it might have felt like when you wondered if the, our government was really telling us the truth. Were we over there to let the Vietnamese fight the war? But he started finding that out pretty quickly. So you need to change that to computer and RGB two. So I'll turn it over to Willard. He's a now he's a hero in my book, but he'd laugh at that and probably slap me too. But uh, anyway, Willard, it's yours. So finally. Mm -hmm. Okay. As soon as we get the uh, laptop and RGB two on the screen. Okay, I went into the Army right out of college. Back in uh, 1959, I went into flight school. At about 19, uh, uh, I went to the flight school in the 1960. And 
uh, shortly after that, the little unit I was in ended up being shipped over to the island of Okinawa. It'll, it'll take a second to, to, to pick it up. Oh, hang on. It's, I'm disconnected over here. Frank yep. slipped over and pulled the plug out on Willard, so Frank, that's why he was doing KC so much. There we go. <laughs> okay, this is the L-19 uh, that I flew, and we, we have another L-19 pilot sit over the corner, Terry. This particular one is uh, from the flight school. All the L-19s at flight school uh, had the big blue orange on them. Uh, that was to warn anybody else that you've got a, a young idiot in here trying to learn to fly and uh, to stay away from him. Uh, the instrument panel, uh, this is about the pilot's eye view of it. And this particular one is it's a modern day picture of someone's airplane. I just pulled it off of the internet. But this particular one happens to be a training, a flight training airplane. This throttle quadrant right here was only used on the airplanes that were Fort Rucker in flight school. Uh, all the other airplanes in the Army had a different throttle quadrant. This happened to be an A model with the, with the uh, electric panel here. Uh, if you got in trouble, you could pull this yellow handle, the door would fall off, and, uh, and you would could, uh, bail out of the thing. Uh, I don't know, I've never heard of anyone bailing out of one. Uh, you could crash land it at about 40 miles an hour, and you were in a cockpit that was uh, pretty sturdy, so uh, you were probably just about as safe uh, landing it that way. Uh, this is some young, eager uh, pilot in early Vietnam. Uh, I was on the old island of Okinawa, uh, in 61 to 62. In December of 62, our unit was sent to uh, Vietnam. Uh, I was only had to stay there six months because I'd been on the old island of Okinawa. So at that time, there were something like around 12 or 13,000 Americans in Vietnam. Uh, the particular unit I was in was running an airfield. We had the control tower, we had the operations, we had the fire truck. Uh, but I flew with this helicopter company uh, that had three L-19s. Uh, the Army issued me a beautiful brand new green helmet, olive drab green. About six months later they said, well you need to paint them white. Uh, so if you go down someplace, uh, you'll be easy to see. <laughs> about four months after that, we're in Vietnam flying around with white helmets on. Um, and about a year or so later, they changed back to green. Uh, this is my parachute. You notice I don't have it on. We never got high enough to bail out of the thing. Uh, and I would prefer to have uh, crash landed it anyway. Wearing a flak vest, which would do something first to distort the shape of it. Uh, if it came through that piece of plexiglass, glass, it just slowed it down enough to uh, not kill you quite as fast. We sat on a quarter inch plate of steel, uh, and on top of that was a, was a groin protector, which was made very much like this flak vest. It just stayed in the airplane. You'd just sit in the airplane and wrap it up around your hips and pull your seatbelt tight. Uh, and that was it. Uh, that was all of our protection. Uh, later on, they may have put something else in there, but that's all we had. Uh, this is the uh, little base I was located at. It was Sok Train, Vietnam. This was down in the Delta land of Vietnam. Uh, the land is just as flat as this floor for as many miles as you can see. Uh, it's all rice fields. Uh, when we were fighting the war later, it was all up north of Saigon in the jungle. This part of the war was still being fought by the, by the Vietnamese. This is an old Japanese airfield from World War II. The uh, hangar building here in the back had been built by the Japanese. Uh, I've actually read uh, some of the history of, uh, of early uh, World War II action, and it mentions this airfield. Uh, this picture again, the Army had a I'm, I'm, I'm brand new with this thing, as you can tell. Uh, the Army had a strange paint system in those days. Uh, the, this dark color is yellow. Uh, they had some airplanes that had yellow numbers and letters. They had some airplanes that had white numbers and letters. And they had some airplanes that had a mixture of, of white and yellow. So I can tell on this one that this happens to be yellow. Uh, that's the very same airplane that I'm leaning up against with the yellow numbers. Uh, this is what I wore uh, for flying, again the flak vest. Uh, it was the rule on the field is that you carried an automatic firing weapon. Uh, my issued weapon happened to be an automatic firing M2 carbine. Uh, this is a little John Wayne uh, stuff down here. We take two clips and tape them together uh, upside down. 
Uh, they gave me about 60 rounds of ammunition, and that was quite common with all the guys on the field. We were also supposed to carry a, 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 a sidearm. Uh, I could have been issued a 45. This particular one is one that I purchased, so it was uh, uh, my own personal weapon. Those men who uh, showed up and, and needed an automatic firing weapon, they said, well, how do I get one? And, well, uh, there's a lieutenant that is an advisor to a uh, Vietnamese unit here, and when he comes in uh, on a weekend to get something to drink, ask him. And he had access to multiple types of automatic firing weapons with no paperwork. <laughs> the Army had given them all to the Special Forces to hand out to these villages, to uh, and the little militias in these villages. So he'd, he'd say, what do you want? What do you got? Well, I got 40, uh, 45 caliber Thompson submachine guns, I got 45 caliber top grease guns, I've got uh, uh, British stem guns, 9mm, what do you want? Uh, you'd tell him, he'd bring it in, uh, hand it to you, and you'd say, uh, what do I need to sign? You don't need to sign anything. What I do with it when I leave? Take it home with you if you want to, or, or just leave it here and give it to someone else. This was home. Uh, Sock train, uh, about 100 miles due south of Saigon. Again, it's all s s rice land. Uh, if you see this on a modern day Google Earth picture, this highway is, is just lined with houses. There's a highway up here lined with houses. Uh, there has been a big population boom in Vietnam since the war. Again, an old Japanese airfield. Every, every morning and every uh, evening, we would do a, a round-robin mission out around the airfield, out about 15, 20 miles, just flying around, just seeing what's out there. Uh, make sure that, that there's nothing out there that, that, that wants to surprise us. Uh, another mission that I flew frequently, the, uh, this was all a war being fought by the, by the Vietnamese. They had little outposts all scattered out here, armed with a, a few men, uh, four or five or up to a hundred or two, uh, defending a, a, a canal junction or something. Uh, so it, the base would get a phone call, we've got wounded Vietnamese out here, we need to come pick them up in helicopters and, and fly them back in either, either here or into the Canto or to the hospital. None of these helicopter pilots at this time were qualified to fly instruments where you fly the airplane just using the instruments. So an L-19 always went out in front of them. And if I flew into a cloud and I said, hey, I just went IFR, these guys would turn around and start back and they'd be in the bar drinking beer before I could get back on the, on the ground. It was pitch black. Uh, you don't see any houses out here. You know, there are now, but there weren't then. Uh, you get up in the air and look, you could, you could see where the horizon was because from here up were stars. But from here down was just black. There'd be a few lights over here, a few lights over here, a sprinkle of lights somewhere else. Uh, there were no roads. All of the transportation was on canals. And the lights you see are basically uh, lanterns. Uh, probably not electric electricity. The information would be uh, uh, fly heading of 270 degrees, 15 miles, or a big bonfire. We'll, we'll build a big bonfire in the middle of an open field. So the helicopters would go out, but they would find the bonfire with their landing lights. They had to find a place and land. Uh, they would get out with their white helmets on and uh, load back up, and we'd either fly back to here, and they would be picked up and taken to the hospital, or fly up to a, a town called Canto and dropped off. And, and I would lead the helicopters up there, and I would lead them back down uh, to my field. Uh, I volunteered that, that quite frequently. I didn't drink very much at that time. In fact, I drank, I drank nothing uh, at all. Uh, except Cokes, and uh, so I was always the one that was sober, and uh, uh, so I got that mission quite quite frequently. I was, they also made me instructor pilot. I would uh, they'd get a new man in, uh, maybe a helicopter pilot, but he's also qualified to fly fixed wing, and I would fly around with him just to make sure he still knew how to fly, and to, and to uh, show him the local area. Uh, then they, come, they asked me one day, they said, um, we've got an Air Force lieutenant here who's going to be a, a, a fact for the Air Force, and he's going to be flying L-19s, and he needs someone to show him how to fly. 
So uh, I met him and I said, what have you been flying? He said, well, I've been flying F-100s. <laughs> well, have you ever flown a tail of airplane? He said, I think I rode in one one time. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the difference between an airplane with a nose wheel and an airplane with a tail wheel. Um, if you take a tricycle and you roll it backwards across the floor with the, with the one wheel going forward, it will spin around and roll two wheels forward. That is a, a, a law of physics. Uh, so a tail wheel airplane is always trying to turn around and go tail first. And you steer it with your feet and you have to have some real happy feet sometimes to keep this thing going straight the faster you go. So I'm going to have to check out this F-100 pilot who's never flown a tail wheel airplane. Um, our top speed was probably not even his landing speed. <laughs> so uh, anyway, he actually did quite good. Uh, we went out and um, uh, had to, he had to forget a few things that he, he did in the F-100 and he had to remember a few things he had to do in the L-19. And I flew with him two or three hours and I said, so as I'm concerned, you're okay. And he, and he left. Uh, no paperwork, no nothing. Uh, I went to a school for six months. We spent uh, two months learning just to go out and land in, in short fills. Uh, land on roads like, like they did in World War uh, II. Uh, however, by the time they got to Vietnam, everybody was using pretty good fields. My first combat mission, I'd only been there about two, two or three weeks. So we're right around Christmas of 1962. Uh, there's a little town here called Ok Bok. Okay, now these are all canals. There's not a single road out here. These are all canals. When we got there, I was going to be radio relay. We would always send out an airplane with a, with a ground pounding uh, officer in the back seat who would radio relay between the troops on the ground and, and in this case, back to headquarters at Bok Lu. So that was going to be my, my job. I'm going to have to pick him up here. We're going to be dropping out here some ways. The, the map that I had showed this canal, this canal, and this canal. And that's it. It didn't show anything else. It just had the symbol for swampland. And the, the briefer, who was also going to be flying the L-19, he would lead the helicopters out, each, each load with the, with the troops in it. He said, we're going to be going to a village about right here. And he said, it's on a canal. But he, he failed to mention there was a canal, 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 canal. So my goal was to pick up this lieutenant the helicopter is coming from this way, and meet them, we'll rendezvous at the same time. Well, either they were early or I was late, and when we get out here starting up this canal, the helicopter's already gone, troops are on the ground. And we don't see anybody here, and we don't see anybody here, and here, just, they're little villages. And pretty soon we're up here, and there's a great big canal, and I knew I had gone too far. So we turn around and come back, and I think, oh, we got a radio in this airplane, that the guy on the ground can push a button and send out a radio signal and we can home in on it. So I turned that on. It didn't work. I found out later that when the armies, when the airplanes were modified to go to Vietnam, they took that radio out. So the next thing is, uh, hey, on the ground, do you see an airplane coming south down the canal? No. So we kept flying and then, oh yeah, I see this airplane coming. We're going to make a left turn. Oh yeah, he's making a left turn. Where are you? Well, you're just about over us right now. So <laughs> that's how we found the troops on the ground. And we were about right here someplace. And about this time, the, the next load of helicopters came out with the next load of troops. They come out, they swing around, and they land in the rice paddies, and all the Vietnamese troops get out. And one of the pilots of one of the helicopters said, you know what? He said, we got shot at by, from that other village as we were coming around the land. Someone shot at us. So then there's a lot of discussion about maybe we're at the wrong village. So, and then some radio conversation back to headquarters and the, and the, the guy says, okay, let's go back to Baklu and work this out. So we go back in and we land and uh, it's lunchtime. We go in and to what had probably one time been a, a French chalet, a very nice building. Uh, I ate a Vietnamese cooked American version of a meal, or a, a Vietnamese version of American meal. And the decision made, uh, you, they've been dropped off in the wrong place. 
So uh, we send word back, all the helicopters are going to come out, they're going to take everybody back. So I flew up by myself, just a watchtower. This is where the guards live that are guarding Baklu International Airport. Uh, the helicopters come out to pick everybody up. Uh, and when they take off, they, they're in this position. The, the nose is low, this nose gear is, is down lower than everything else. And they were taken off out of rice paddies. So they would hover up into the air, and then as they lower the nose to go forward, the nose hole went back down into the water. And, and so I'm looking down at this thing with these big blades thrashing around, and it looks like a speedboat going through the water with the waves coming up off of the nose well. And they finally get enough speed, and they lift up, and, and everybody gets back. So the whole thing was an absolute flop. Uh, the only shot that was fired that was that one shot that was fired out of a helicopter because they went over to the village where the, where the uh, beastie of the girl levels were. If someone had had some really good foresight, uh, this might have been a foretelling of, of what this war is going to be like. The, the Vietnamese at, at canal junctions, they would build a dirt fort. It reminded me of the Old West when we had forts out west. These are anything from real small with four or five men in there defending this intersection to maybe a pretty nice size one. Uh, and this is a, a, a pretty decent size. And, and they were all over that delta land down there at canal junctions. So one of my missions one day was to, uh, I had a brand new man, we we're going to give him a check out, show him the area, and they gave us a box and just some little packages in it. And they said, here's a map, fly to these places around and drop these little packages. And there's little goodies in there for the people. And there were big packages and small packages to spend in some, depending on the size of these uh, forts. So I'm in the back seat, he's flying the airplane, we get over one and, uh, and uh, we're getting to do, oh, we're getting a flag, zoom across here at 50 feet high, 20 feet high, whatever, just have a ball. And I throw the little package out the window. We get to the very last one. It's a pretty good size one. And we come uh, zooming across here about 20 feet high below the tops of the trees. And then I throw the little package out and I look up and there's this radio antenna sticking up right in front of us. <laughs> it's a whip antenna. It's just a, it's about the size of your finger, about 10 or 15 feet long. And I screamed out antenna and he pulled the airplane up and wham, it hit the, the left wing of the airplane. and probably knocked off their radio communications. That left them isolated out there totally. Um, and we flew on back and uh, couldn't see anything wrong. You get on back and, and sure enough, there's a little dent in the leading edge of the wing of the airplane. And, and right in line with it, back by the trailing edge, was a, was a hole. And everybody said, oh, you got shot in. And I said, well, but the bullet went through from the top. And they said, well, when you were out there turning, you know, somebody shot, oh, okay. But I knew what it was. When we hit that antenna, it went <laughs> and poked a hole in it. But on my, on my uh, uh, official military record, it went down as a combat uh, uh, damage to the aircraft with a bullet hole. Uh, the, there, there was one big thing that I, I was on the sideline, but it was a perfect example of how the L-19 was used over there. Uh, I was not flying it. This friend of mine right here, Joe O'Neill, was flying it. Uh, this photo was taken when we were on an LST on the way from Okinawa to uh, Vietnam. This is the village of Atbak, uh, and this is a modern-day Google Earth uh, photo. Uh, at that time, there were none of this was none of these houses were out here. It was just this one little tiny village. Uh, this was January the second, 1963, uh, and this helicopter company that we were supporting uh, sent ten helicopters out here. Uh, there were Vietnamese troops coming up from the south, there were Vietnamese troops coming down this way, and armored personnel carriers. The helicopters were dropping everybody out in here. Uh, I happened to arrive there about midday. I was hitchhiking uh, a ride home from Saigon, and someone said, well, you can get on this metal lady back. It's going back down to Tan Hip, and when the 93rd goes home tonight, you can ride home with them. So I spent the afternoon uh, standing by a jeep with the radio along with five or six other men listening to this debacle, an absolute total debacle. Uh, Colonel Van, who was rather famous during the, the, the Vietnam War, was actually killed as a civilian back over there trying to help them, uh, was in the L-19 with my friend Joe O'Neill flying it. Uh, they put in about six, seven hours that day orbiting over this village. Uh, every three hours or so they'd come in and land and get gas. Uh, he would run up and talk to the Vietnamese general uh, and then come back down and then get in the airplane and go back out again. They made low passes over this village, drawing fire. 
uh, never did get hit. Uh, radio missions, uh, with the, he would call back, and we could only hear Colonel Van. We could not hear the men on the ground. The, uh, there was artillery fire falling out here someplace. And